must there. Okay. All right, so I think I'll just go ahead and start. Again, welcome everyone. I am Gretchen Shaw. I'm the deputy director here at NCADV, and we are just thrilled about today's session. As many of you heard, and as some of you are just joining, we've had nearly 2,000 people register for this. Um, which has blown our minds. Um, and people are joining like as we speak. So we're up to about 700 people on the call right now. Um, I'm going to move through just uh, several uh, housekeeping slides and we're going to ask a few polls of the audience. But we really encourage you to share and uh, comment, particularly in the chat box. We will also be watching the Q&A, but we want this to be as interactive as possible. With the number of people we have on the call today, it's going to be hard to get to those of you with your hands raised, um, but we will do our best. All right, so uh, just a few things to go over for today's session. This session will be recorded in all registrants attendees will receive a link to the recording within a few days after this session ends. Um, also, we will be posting this, uh, uh, this recording to NCADV's YouTube chan channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search for our full name, you'll be able to access it there once it's posted. Also, as you can see, we have um, ASL translators with us today. Uh, and that translation is being provided by Interprose. They're going to be there throughout the session, and we have pinned their videos to the top. So those of you who are um, in need of those services can have that access. Also, all participants will receive a link to a downloadable certificate of attendance for today's session. That will be included in the follow-up email that's sent within a few days of the conclusion of the session. And then also you'll be prompted to complete a short uh, survey at the end of this webinar. And we really encourage you to do that. Your feedback is very important to us. And we do take your comments and your suggestions very seriously. Again, today's session is meant to be as interactive as we could make it. So please use the chat box liberally. We're going to be posting all the questions that we're going to be asking of today's panelists on the screen so that both they can reference it and then you can reference it as we move through each of those conversations. Um, and we're, we have a few polls and we, we encourage you to uh, respond to those as well. Um, we will be, and I have this incorrect on the screen, so forgive me for that, but we will be taking questions at the end of the session after we've moved through everything. We're expecting that we probably won't be able to answer everyone's questions today, but we will certainly do our best. We encourage you to ask those in the chat box. We'll also be watching the Q&A box, but it's a little bit easier for us to manage the chat box. So if you could please be mindful of that, we'd appreciate it. Okay, so we're gonna do just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today, we're very, really interested in knowing where you all are located. And I'm very well aware that some of these states may be miscategorized <laughs> based on what, how you all identify it. But um, also, please, if you're not located uh, in the United States, we welcome you to the session and we would love to know where you're from. So please make sure you uh, put, put your location in the chat box. We've got people from everywhere. Montgomery, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, so welcome. Hi, Donna. Hawaii, Minnesota. Lots of folks from Montgomery, great. It's my hometown. Kentucky, New York, Pennsylvania, California. This is really exciting. Wonderful, okay. I'm gonna close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Very good. Got people from all over, but it looks like the East Coast is the strongest content, uh, contingent, followed by the South Midwest and then West. Okay. So who's participating today? How would you describe your role? And I, we realize this isn't a totally inclusive list, 
but we're very interested to, to know a little bit about how you all identify your role in this field or your really your connection to the issue. Great, so we've got some BIP facilitators, Stu everyone, nurses, probation officers, Title IX coordinators, guardian ad litems, wonderful, legal advocates, child advocate, social worker, victim advocate, this is great. Wow, we're excited, very excited. Okay, so most people have answered. I'm gonna close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. I can get my mouse to work. All right, so wonderful. We Yes, what's not uncommon here is that we do see a lot of domestic violence and sexual assault advocates, survivors, but I'm thrilled to see today that we've got first responders, those who work in the legal field, the medical field and government, the mental health field and the students and then others, therapists, um, fundraisers. So wonderful, welcome everyone, welcome everyone. All right. So today, as you're well aware, the title is Why Aren't the Abusers Held More Accountable? Flipping the script on why doesn't the victim just leave? So today's panelists, I will do quick introductions for each of them. Today, we have uh, NCADB's president and CEO, Ruth Glenn. Um, Ms. Glenn was prior to coming to NCADV, she was employed by the Colorado Department of Human Services for 28 years and served as the director of the domestic violence program for the last nine of those years. She retired from the state in 2013 and then we are lucky enough to get her. So she's worked and volunteered in the domestic violence field for over 27 years and holds a master's in public administration from the University of Colorado Denver program on domestic violence. She served on many domestic violence program and funding and grant administration boards provided hundreds of presentations on domestic violence, victimization, and survival. She's testified before the Colorado State Legis Legislature and the United States Congress and provided consultation, training, and technical assistance on a local and national level on victim and survivor issues. Uh, Ruth is a survivor herself, and she often shares her experience as a survivor to bring awareness about the dynamics of domestic violence. So, and I have the honor of working with her. Mm -hmm. um, our, one of our other fabulous presenters today is April Himerson. And April, I realized I didn't ask how to pronounce your last name correctly. I hope I got that right. Jimerson. Jimerson, wonderful. Yeah. So April Jimerson is the director of training for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, where she develops curriculum and provides the hotline's 100 plus hour training on domestic violence, which is a tall order, on so domestic violence, healthy relationships, and culturally responsive advocacy to new and tenured advocates year round. Additionally, today we have Victoria Reeves, who is the program specialist at Ujima Inc., the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. Victoria Reeves um, has worked there for a few years and she's primarily responsible for providing national training and technical assistance to service providers in the community at large that centers the needs, voices, intersections, and realities of Black women and girls. So welcome, of course, to the three of you. I am very excited about this conversation and hearing your thoughts. Um, now I'm going to turn this over to Ruth Glenn for a few minutes just to give you all an idea of what we want to do with this session and where we hope to see it go. Great. Thank you so much, um, Gretchen, for first of all, pulling this all together. And it is absolutely my honor to work with you. Um, and also thanks so much to Victoria and April who um, it not only willingly, but excitedly offered to be a part of this discussion. 
Um, the preface I'd like to offer for this discussion today is that it is a discussion. Um, we do not claim to be experts in abusers and abuser accountability. We also are not claiming as part of this discussion to um, explore uh, of an understanding or know all of the intersecting issues when we're talking about persons that abuse and or abusers. Um, April and Victoria and I had a discussion um, about what did we want to do with this and um, yesterday as a matter of fact, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that we were very, very clear that in everyone's own way own community, own experience as victim survivors, advocates, and batterer intervention treatment uh, folks um, has a different uh, mode of doing it. Our, our hope today and the conceit for today is to have at least the beginning of a discussion. We're also very excited that there are so many of you here, um, I'm no pressure at all, um, but we're hoping that you will use the opportunity that Gretchen talked about, which is to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we hope to get to those as we can. And as you can imagine, with so many people on the, on the webinar, it won't be, possible, won't be possible to get to all of them. But we may use those questions um, to better inform any uh, follow-up that we might want to do. So I want you to know that we will certainly consider whether uh, we should do this again. Um, and again, big thanks to April and Vic Victoria, to all the NCADB team, translators and interpreters, and everyone that's helped put this together today. I'm very much looking forward to it. Wonderful. So Ruth, um, people are requesting your camera, if you're willing to share that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, okay. I prefer to not be seen. <laughs> Also, I just want to, I'm going to take a shameless, make a shameless plug for this, but what's exciting about holding this conversation now is it really can guide us as we move into 2022. For those of you who don't know, NCADV is holding our National Conference on Domestic Violence in St. Louis, August 28th through 31st, 2022. So, we hope you'll all, you will all be there and we will certainly take this conversation into consideration and perhaps we can continue the dialogue there. All right, so I'm going to move into the questions that we're going to be asking of each of the panelists. Um, we will, I'll post the question, uh, I will read the question, and then each panelist will answer in their own time. But what's important to this is we really want you to also share your thoughts in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, so here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, gosh, I'm just not, I'm, pardon me, I'm not 100% today. We do have two polls. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do this first. All right, so at some point in your life, have you ever wondered why doesn't the victim just leave? Your answers are anonymous, so don't be shy about answering any of these questions. We're not going to share them in any way. We are um, just simply interested in knowing your thoughts. And for those of you uh, who may be joining us via Facebook Live, please share your feedback in the comment section. We're gonna be capturing that as well. So we don't want you to feel excluded from the conversation. We're watching both platforms very closely. All right, wonderful. The majority of people have answered. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in five, four, Three, two, one. Yeah, not a surprise. The large eighty-one percent of us have have thought to ourselves, "Why doesn't the victim just leave?" And there's a good percentage of people, almost twenty percent, who say they haven't. So that's fantastic. All right. So my next question, our next question is, how often do you wonder why does the abuser keep hurting their partner? And again, these answers are anonymous, so if, please be candid. There's no judgment. We're just very curious to hear.
We're going to give this a few minutes because there's a whole bunch of y'all today. We're up to 902 per two participants. It's wonderful. All right, great. So I'm going to give it just another second. Okay. All right, we're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So this, yeah, these results are really interesting, I think. So 40% of us said 40% of the time we think, why does the abuser keep hurting their partner all the time? 33% said most of the time. 21% said seldom. 6% said never. Fabulous. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. So we're going to move into our first question, finally, now. All right. Again, share your thoughts in the chat box. And... Um, April, Victoria, and Ruth, the first question, first question cluster, I should say, is what goes through your mind when you hear the question, why doesn't the victim just leave? What do you think contributes to this being one of the very first questions that seem to be asked in general conversations about intimate partner violence? How do you think this question impacts victims and how do you think it impacts or reflects a community's response to IPV? So let's see, how about Victoria? Would you like to start the conversation? It started with me. So thank you so much for having uh, me here. But um, so when I hear that question, um, uh, you know, why didn't the victim just leave or why didn't you just leave? It, it, it speaks to me clearly that there's still a lot of work for us to do. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, why question shows, you know, the ongoing misconceptions of IPV. Um, it places the responsibility of change on the survivor and it, it totally disregards the complexities of this type of violence. Um, you know, why doesn't the victim leave stems from, it, it stems from victim blaming. And it makes us, and, I, and when I say us, because it's ingrained in our society, the poll we just did lets us know that we all have been, not all of us, but most of us have been in a place where we said, why didn't the victim just leave? But it makes us feel more comfortable to believe that in order to be harmed, the victim has had to do something wrong. Um, and acknowledging that that's actually not the truth, you know? Acknowledging that we don't have to do anything wrong to be assaulted, abused, manipulated, controlled. Um, it highlights the idea that abuse or violence could happen to anyone and anyone being us, me and you. Um, so instead of, you know, acknowledging that abuse can happen to anyone, we take the comfortable route, you know, the beautiful lie that the victim must have done something to be harmed or um, that they could have done something to prevent the harm. And I know that there's a few different pieces to the question, but I'll, um, I'll stop there and, and jump back in on another piece of the question. Great. Uh, let's say April. Sure. Um, first of all, again, thank you for having us. And I am so uh, honored to be able to kind of share some space with folks who are doing all sorts of amazing work. Um, in the field. I am the director of training at the hotline um, where we answer the calls and chats and texts for folks who um, are either supporting someone who's in an abusive relationship or they themselves are in an abusive relationship. And we hear this question all the time, especially from helpers. Um, as Gretchen mentioned, we, we have a five week training now for our advocates and really grappling with this question and how we respond to it is such a key piece of, of what we're doing in general in our movement and then on the individual level as well. And I agree with Victoria, This the, every time this question's asked, whether it's out loud or whether it's our, our first uh, initial thought, it's talking and directly to how much we have to continue to do to, to shift some of the frameworks we've been working with when it comes to understanding violence for so long. Because when the onus of responsibility is on the victim, is on the survivor, 
we continue to limit our creativity with how we can support them and how we can make actual change with the actual abusive behaviors and those who are who are perpetrating that harm, right? Which is what this uh, session is kind of really wanting us to grapple with. And um, I really appreciate Victoria saying that it's a very comfortable spot to be in, a very comfortable response, a very innate protective response that we have as people, honestly, if we just break down where that stems from. When we ask, why did they stay? Why don't you just leave? Um, we're, we're going in with the assumption that the expectation is for them to leave, right? We're going in with the assumption that it should be that easy. And to go a little further with the comfort that Victoria was talking about, it, it makes us more comfortable as people to think that it should be that easy. That if it were me, I would have left a long time ago. If it were me, I wouldn't have found myself in that situation. If it were me, I would know how to get out, right? So there's a, there's a sort of individual personal um, point that we have to get uncomfortable with to understand that this can happen to anyone, including ourselves. And when we allow ourselves to investigate where that comes from, it's, it's a very conditioned response, right? I, I talk about all the time growing up, I heard um, my Thea's talking about, you know, uh, women in these situations and saying things like, ah, bueno, ya, ya, le gusta la mala vida, which translates to, well, that's on her. Uh, she loves the rough life. She loves the bad life. Um, and it's, it's completely speaking to how entrenched this is, right, when our response is constantly to the only reason or the only way the abuse should stop is if the survivor leaves, um, and this is a choice that they're continuing to make to stay, um, and so there's so many different directions we need to kind of really untangle um, to actually make a lot more progress on where the conversation has to be, which is how do we truly interrupt these behaviors from continuing to happen and from people being so harmed so constantly. Thank you. Okay, Ruth. Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks to uh, Victoria and April. Um, there were two words that came out of it that I'm, I'm going to hold on to. Uh, one is it makes us comfortable. One is that there's an assumption that it's a choice by the victim versus a choice by someone who causes harm to someone else. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and I'm going to take a little bit different tack on it. And um, particularly the last part of the question is how does it make victims feel? And then why is why are we as a society so comfortable with this? Um, I think victims already feel as though it's their fault. And guess who has helped them feel that way? Um, the abusive person. Um, so as a society, when we hold them accountable, because that's the theme of our webinar, we're reinforcing that message that they've been getting um, either through an environmental piece like April described or other ways in which we say you are responsible. Um, and I'd like for us to also think from a societal perspective, which is, you know, we still live in a society very much so that is, is based and rooted in, in patriarchy and those, all of those isms and social uh, mores that, that we have become used to. But, but what I'm thinking as April and Victoria are talking is uh, we also live in a society that uh, it, it, we can accept when uh, children are vulnerable and hurt, when pets are vulnerable and hurt. We have a very difficult time understanding why an adult person would allow someone else to hurt them. But there's the key. From our perspective, they're allowing that to happen. Um, and if we can remove the allow lens um, or, uh, you know, permission lens uh, from the victim and an adult victim, we would begin to understand far more about what is happening for that person and really beginning to delve into uh, some of the comfortableness we have around it and some of the choices that the abusive party is making. Um, so 
hopefully that was not too much of a lecture. Keep forgetting to turn my mute, bo mute button on. Okay. Uh, for those that ask why victims stay, what do you wish they understood instead? And again, please, you all are doing a wonderful job sharing your thoughts. Please keep that going. So let's start with Ruth this time. Um, I think that, uh, so um, why, what was the question? Why, what do I wish that, that everyone understood about why victims stay? Um, I think um, I'm, it's not going to be any different for those of the, um, those folks joining us via webinar in April and Victoria, and most of us know. What I challenge us to think about, not only as the helpers, but as a society, is really thinking about the individuality of victims and survivors. I think in our desire, when and if we are put in a position to be helpful, or to ponder that question, we want everything to be neatly wrapped and in a toolkit. And here you go, uh, this will be helpful to you. And um, I understand you're going through something, but, but here's the box of all of the things that you'll need, that you need to consider, that you need to think about. And once you go through that, everything's going to be fine. Um, what I want people to remember is just like in any normal movement as individuals in our world, uh, victims who are subject to abusive behaviors by someone else are also individuals. And the myriad of things that they have to think about uh, from everyday uh, things like how am I going to pay rent to the larger societal issues of how are people going to view me? How is my, my community going to view me? What do I need to do over here? Um, there are no two victims alike, just like there are two, no two abusive persons alike. Um, if, if we don't walk away from, from anything in, in regards to this entire conversation, I hope we will remember that, that there's no plug and play, there's no toolkit that is readily available for anyone um, that we can provide to them um, on their journey to safety. Thank you. Okay, um, April, I'll have you go next. Sure, thank you. What do I wish uh, folks who asked that question understood? Uh, there's so many pieces to this. Um, I think it's multi-pronged for sure. Uh, a couple of things to really focus on um, when we're talking about what we really need to understand is when there's that, that, that expectation of, of someone leaving the abusive relationship, that is a very complex um, sort of condition to set for someone. Uh, one of the biggest things I can say that is so important to understand is that leaving is the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship. And so I know at the hotline, we talk a lot about how we don't go into our conversations with an agenda of trying to give, convince people to leave their abusive relationships because we know that is, first of all, one of the most dangerous times, something that can make the situation so much more unsafe, and it does not feel very possible, plausible, realistic for so many people. And to be survivor centered, we really instead shift the conversation more to what do they need? What is it that that would support someone being safer with whatever decision they're making, whether it's staying in the situation, whether it's leaving the situation, and we go from there. And that is really part of our mission of, of shifting that power back to those who have been so disempowered within their relationship. We know abuse is about power and control. And we know that to take steps like leaving is a huge shift of power that takes time and may not be the reality for so many people. And there could be multitudes of reasons why people stay and all of them are valid. We, have a list on our website. I think it's called something like five obstacles to leaving, 50 obstacles to leaving. And they go and it's talking about so many different valid reasons that survivors have shared, whether it's an economic strain, whether it's having no system, no support outside, whether it's 
uh, children that they share with their partner, fear of losing their home, uh, losing their jobs, having to change so much of themselves, uh, whether it's uh, honestly still loving the partner, that is something that we forget is that people stay in, uh, in, in bad relationships for so many reasons. Those are the same reasons a lot of people in abusive relationships uh, might find themselves staying as well. And the key thing about abuse is that it never starts the way it escalates, right? And there's an assumption that that there there should have been, you know, that you should have known that that you should now respond in a way that reflects what's happening now when really the reality is, is folks are responding with having to take everything into account in their lives and what that means for them. So when we're talking about um, survivors, we, we just uh, started a session on survivorship that was really talking about the myth of the perfect victim, right? Where these kinds of expectations for victims um, speak to what we expect from, um, from survivors, that there's a certain way that they have to operate, a certain way they have to live or show up in order to be granted our understanding, our sympathy, right? Once it shifts away from this perfect victim ideal, which it's someone who um, doesn't have any anger, hasn't responded in the same way to their abusive partner, has no history of any sort of uh, drugs or alcohol or criminal history. Anytime anything deviates from that, it almost it starts knocking notches down from how much we believe them, how much we're there and willing to support them. And that really is what we need to be asking more. We need to be asking more, what are the conditions that we are all contributing to? What are the systems that have been upheld for so long that are continuing to, um, as continuing to uh, breed this violence, right? We know violence breeds violence and poverty is violence. Um, racism is violence and all of these things intersect and have direct correlations with how we see DV show up in our communities. And so we really need to be shifting the conversation more into how are we contributing to these conditions that have been in place and how, are, how is how we're speaking about it, how, are, how is how we're asking our questions, continuing to sustain those systems that, um, that make it so much more complex to address the actual, actual issues of changing behavior. Thank you. Okay, Victoria. Okay, I really don't have much to add to, the, to those points uh, other than what, what was sticking out to me is um, how, how society or its community we see staying as a sign of weakness. Um, when in actuality, you know, when we think about survivors and the term in general, the survivor being able to make it daily through those, the abuser's tactics is a sign of strength. So, um, and just shifting our thoughts from seeing staying as a, as a bad thing in actuality, it's, a, it's, it's strength, it's survival. Um, but I wanted to also look at like a different piece of this of um, what, do I, what do I wish people understood about why victims stay is looking at offenders in general. And while you all were talking, I was trying to look through my notes here. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm, some people probably have heard of the book, um, When Violence Begins at Home by KJ Wilson. It's a very older book, but there was a piece in there. And I just, the disclaimer, the book was written a while ago and um, um, based off heterosexual relationships of the male, the offender, the, the woman, the, uh, the survivor. But I think the, the, the concept, could, it, it still stands. Um, and so I, I, there was a piece in the book and I, I'm gonna change the pronoun so that it's appropriate for these times. But it says, one of the greatest fears a batterer has is the fear that, is, that their partner will abandon them. This manifests itself in extreme jealousy and possessiveness. They believe that if they can completely control them, they won't leave. Batterers rely so heavily on their partners that they are willing to do anything to keep them from leaving, even maiming or killing them. And I think that's a good point to put in here is that um, it's not necessarily that survivors are staying. There have been so many tactics and uh, bricks and layers that have been stacked against the survivor leaving. So it's not necessarily that they're choosing to stay. It's that the, the offender has created systems in their home or wherever they are in their relationship where the survivor, it's almost impossible to leave. Um, and so just changing our thinking and understanding that, and, and again, shifting the responsibility away from the survivor and placing the accountability on the offender. It's not that the survivor is just staying. 
the offender has created a system where that they will not leave. And I think that's just important to put in there. And, and I can I just comment really quickly. So first of all, um, April and, and Victoria, what great context around um, that particular question. I would also have us think about a society that's really comfortable with stats and a status quo. Um, so whenever we can put a stat to something, um, it makes us very, very comfortable. And I encourage you and every one of us as we walk away from this conversation today to not talk about the stats of, um, and, and, and I don't mean that those aren't important. I wanna be very careful about that. Stats are important, very important. Uh, but when we're talking about this particular issue and, and really trying to hone in on um, what it is that we need to be talking about, um, I think oftentimes the safety is in a number. So we find ourselves moving to these numbers. Um, and I would encourage us, I, this is going to sound so corny, but there is a commercial out uh, called uh, Small Talk, and it's about the foster care system. And it's where um, they're promoting how you talk about this particular issue in these down times of conversations. Um, and I would encourage us to do the same without the stats and the numbers and really helping people understand that it's not about why the victim stays, but it is about all of these other things that are happening. And what are we doing as a whole to change that? Because again, there is no kind of plug and play to, to fix that, so. Thank you for allowing me that moment. Absolutely. And I encourage you, encourage you all to just continue the conversation um, in each of these questions. That's fabulous. Okay, so the next question is, what happens when we omit the perpetrator's role when we speak about intimate partner violence? For example, what do you think of common phrasing such as abusive relationships or a violent situation or relationship abuse or blank was being abused. Um, and let's see, uh, April, we'll start with you. Thank you. I think this is a question that I was um, really kind of sitting with when we're talking about abuse, domestic violence, IPB. There, there is so many different um, terminology and, and language that we could be using to talk about very similar or same situations. Um, and so, of course, if we're if we're talking um, in the sort of more general sense, it makes sense to be using abusive relationships and and talking about the issue at, as a whole. Uh, and I think it's also important to know that there's a, there's a really key balance we have to have when we're talking about specific situations with either people that we know or direct people that we're supporting, where we, we want to work to strike that balance by understanding that we can still focus on the harm and the abusive behaviors that are being perpetuate, perpetrated uh, by someone without having to center the language specifically on the abuse partner. Um, as far as um, with, with labeling, right? I think this is one of the pieces where we can really focus in on talking about asking more directly or centering what is needed for the survivor, what is challenging for the survivor? What is uh, the, the sort of danger and harm that's coming with being in this relationship? So when we're specifically talking about um, or shifting our language or generalizing our language, um, I think that makes sense in that grand scope. But when we're talking about individuals that we might be supporting, that we might be uh, working with, it's important to be able to be comfortable to name what's not okay in the behaviors, to name where we have to, uh, where someone has to accept responsibility for what they're doing. It's, it's, it's so crucial to be naming the tactics. It's so crucial to be naming uh, the dynamics that have been created within the relationship um, and who is creating them. 
right? And that is one key piece of shifting our thinking from why is a victim still there? Why doesn't they, why don't they leave to what is continuing to happen? What do they need to be safer, right? What do we need to do to support someone? Um, what are the behaviors specifically that someone needs to take responsibility for? Um, and that starts with, with being very thoughtful about the language we're using. I should also add that I love the comments that are coming through the chat box. People are absolutely agreeing with that. Saying that it denotes that it was it's mutual violence or that it's um, equal. It doesn't always take two to tango. Okay, uh, Victoria, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, and uh, I just want um, in thinking about this question when we um, omit the perpetrator's role, it, it and of course with the community, but it makes me think about the survivor as well. Um, when we when we leave out the perpetrator's role when discussing IPV, we are honestly assisting the abuser with one of their most useful tactics, which is manipulation. Um, they per perpetrators, and I and I know we're going to talk about language too and how we uh, offenders perpetrators. I know it's coming up, but. Um, perpetrators work over time, you know, to ensure that their behaviors are unaccounted for um, or, you know, go unaddressed. And even they, even when they are, they do their best to blame the survivor or, you know, say it's presented as self-defense. Um, so when we omit the perpetrator's role in, um, in our languages, we are ultimately, we're ultimately doing more harm to the survivor. Um, I think somebody put in the chat, I saw it, I really can't see a lot of the chat, but someone said to change the language at, to be X abuse their partner, whoever it was abuse their partner, instead of putting, you know, the survivor kind of like on the front line. Right. Um, and then another, thing, um, another thing that I'm thinking is that when we omit the, the perpetrator um, from the role, we get systems kind of like how we have now. And I know we can always have more, and, and, I, and, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way. We, we, we could use a lot more support for survivors, but just look at the, the small number of agencies and supportive resources and the funds that are given to hold offenders accountable. There, it's, it's, it's a lot less. And I think that um, we're not putting enough emphasis uh, and even probably due to our language. Um, on how to hold these folks accountable that are destroying lives, families, our community, and even themselves. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there before I you know, go on to a tangent there. <laughs> Tangents are welcome. That's so right. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves. And I'm the tangent queen, so <laughs> let me go into a tangent. <laughs> um, so going back to the language of it all, and then certainly I have a comment about um, the term perpetrator. Um, I, I am a firm believer that our language can be harmful or helpful. And if we are thoughtfully thinking every time we're having a conversation about IPV, domestic violence, and how we're framing that, I think we as a society begin to help the perpetrator as well. We become perpetrators of that, of what's happening because uh, we're using terms such, um, I, I speak quite frequently to the media and the moment they say domestic abuse relationship, I'm all over them because no, it's not a domestic abuse relationship. And that's only one of the terms that we, Quite frankly, because I'm I'm getting really frustrated and fed up with people not um, paying attention, is that it's lazy. It's not thinking about the dynamics of domestic violence, the responsibility that someone who's causing harm to others, um, and we as a society have to ensure that that victim survivor has whatever it is they might decide they need to be safe. Um, so my uh, patience with that part of the laziness is really expired. <laughs> um, and then secondly, um, I do think um, that it helps us when we frame it, reframe it to such a term as the person who's causing harm to others. Because if I say that to someone in a conversation, they don't have any wiggle room. Uh, 
to lay blame somewhere else. They, they are faced with, uh, whether, whether it's a journalist, a colleague, or anyone else that we're, we're talking to about this, if we really put it as starkly as possible and say someone else is causing harm to someone they said they care about, um, and it really helps begin that conversation too um, about all of the many reasons that victims are not feeling safe to leave, right? Um, I think I could not, I think, I know, I couldn't agree with Victoria more about um, how we um, really don't think about where the responsibility should lay and, and how to, to reframe that as we move forward. And I just lost my train of thought. I'm, I'm certain I wrote it down here somewhere. So if I can come back when it comes back. Um, the other thing is that I'm older than my other two colleagues. So sometimes things just shuffle out of my head. <laughs> so, um, but really let's, um, let's lay the blame where the blame belongs. The perpetrator, the abuser, the person who causes harm to someone else does all they can to isolate. And um, Mark, that's what I was going to say. Uh, what Victoria said is they're already isolating and um, compartmentalizing the victim survivor. When we don't address it in that way and really reframe it, we're absolutely helping that person to further abuse. Thank you. Very good. Victoria, did you want to expand on your tangent? And April, too, if you have other comments on this topic. We have plenty of time, so feel oh, free no, to share what you think. I think I've lost my train of thought as well, Ruth. I have a toddler, so, you know, <laughs> hanging in there myself. <laughs> yep, that'll do it. Um, I think what I can add to is, is when we generalize and we don't focus on where the issues are, where the abuse is happening, um, and we use more broad and vague language, we're really opening up that space for continuing to um, blame the victim or the victim blaming themselves, right? Survivors can often, um, it, it kind of leaves it open to say, you know, I, I was in an abusive relationship. To say something like that um, isn't, necessarily directly saying I was abused by someone, right? Which is really speaking to when we're framing our experiences, um, sometimes the language we're using can, can kind of couple us with what is actually happening and who is causing this harm. Um, and so to be very clear on where the harm is coming from, what the harm is, naming that um, directly, is is really key to be able to continue to um, minimize the shift blaming that happens to really directly um, alter some of the, the ways that we're um, questioning, again, why, why survivors stay or why they don't leave. So it, it feels like all connected at one point with just how we're approaching and how we're thinking about relationships in general. Absolutely. Um, so Ruth, I saw your comment, and, um, but some people are asking what some alternative phrasing might be. Um, also, if I could just speak to that quickly, I will have to look for this link, but there was an article written by some colleagues a few years ago that talks about um, flipping language to put the owner onus on the person causing harm. And it's not an easy, it's not always easy. Uh, it's not. So. Um, but we will share that link in the follow-up email. I, it's going to take me a while to find it, but um, I wanted to put that out there to the audience. But if you all think of phrasing that uh, may flip that script, feel free to share it. And of course, those of you who are doing it in the chat box, we encourage you to do it too. So, um, but Ruth, please go ahead with your, your other sure. thought. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is important that comes to mind is as we're talking and I'm watching the chat box and I'm thinking about this is that we should never lose sight of what domestic violence is, which is power and control. And we as society, when we don't reframe how we're talking about this, um, 
we assume very much like what April was talking about, that everybody has equal power in this relationship or that everyone has equal control in what's happening as a part of that relationship. Um, so I, I think when we're thinking about what terms to use, if none come to mind immediately, if for those of this, us that understand the dynamics of power and control, let's just go back there in our head and say, as I'm talking about this, who, how do I want someone to understand who's in control here? And, and, and how do we move through that conversation? Um, I, I think, again, just going back to a couple of other points, which are all of the tactics that a, a person who is causing harm to someone else, and particularly someone they claim to care about, they're making choices, we help make it comfortable and they're the ones that are in control. And if we could just keep that in front of us. And in fact, when, when April and Victoria were taking uh, their turn speaking, I just kept kind of going back to that in my head. Um, I don't think there has to be a packed phrase that's also showing my age, um, but, but think about the phrase in your own way that puts the responsibility back where it belongs. Fabulous. I was getting sucked into the chat box. You all are awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. This is a long one. So this is going to start the conversation around language. So some of the language used in the early decades of the domestic violence movement include uh, battered wife and batterer. And then it shifted a few decades later to abuser, abuse, perpetrator, intimate partner, and now seems to be shifting again to more general phrasing, such as person causing harm and person experiencing harm. What do you all attribute to the shift and why is this important? What are the pros of the shift in this language and what are the cons? And then what do you think is some of the language that we should be using? And I know that's a lot. So if you want to reference the slide um, on the screen, please do so. But also those of you in the chat box, please, we want to hear your thoughts. This, you're doing great. So um, Ruth, how about you start? I thought you'd never ask. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think the shift has been really important about how we frame that. I think we are not using this webinar to talk about all of the other issues such as um, you know, what uh, Victoria brought up yesterday, which is women who use abuse as, as defense mechanisms or um, let's not forget that it's about power and control. So that happens in any relationship in which someone wants to have power and control, whether that be the LGBTQI plus or whatever it is. So I think the shift is important. I really do. Um, it, it, you know, I gotta be frank with you as a survivor, the battered wife piece really makes my hair stand on end. And it's not to say it wasn't important at that time, right? Um, because this issue, this movement, this work had to start somewhere. And we know that it's still women who are the majority of those who are hurt and harmed. But what are, who are those women? They're not just battered wives, right? Battering um, implies physical abuse only. Wife implies that it's only women who are married. So I think the language shift around what domestic violence is uh, needed to happen and it, and it, and it uh, permits the intersection, it, it intersectionality issues that we need to deal with as a movement in a field. Um, and I think um, if we remember still going back to the power and control that even this particular work will continue. In other words, I don't think that domestic violence in, in its phrasing and forms necessarily changes, but helping others understand about domestic violence means using language that fits for them. Um, and works for them. Not all the time because we don't wanna quote unquote water down the issue, 
but we definitely need to meet people, <laughs> meet people where they are um, so that they understand what we're talking about. We're asking society to do something about this issue. If we're talking about it in ways that certain segments of society, certain specific populations of society don't understand, we're not gonna uh, impact change like we hope. Um, that, that, that's our perspective at NCADV and mine certainly. So thank you. Um, April, Victoria, which, whichever one, if you would like to go. How about Victoria? Okay, what, um, what, I, what I think about um, maybe the, the, the pros, I, I, I think using terms like the person causing harm, and I saw it here in the chat and I was like, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I think using the person causing harm, because in, in, in this is kind of like the devil's advocate here because uh, offenders, perpetrators, batterers, whatever term you wanna use, I think those terms are also very harsh. Um, and it, and it, still, it, it still allows the, the, this person that is causing them harm to still be a human. And I think when we look at offenders or batterers, or, you know, those, those terms, those words, when we, when we, put, when we put a human type of, type of aspect on the person, it allows us to support them. It allows them to give them, us to give them the assistance that is necessary to try to help change this, this harmful thinking that they have uh, learned over time from our community, actually. Um, and then I think uh, one of the cons, if I could say, a, if there is a con there um, for a person experiencing harm, a person causing harm, is that sometimes I think we can miss lethality. And we don't, act, we don't actually know what's going on unless we, we take the time to explore. Um, and so um, just again, shortly, I think the only con I think is that uh, it doesn't allow us to get to the, unless we take the time to, to learn more, um, which hopefully it, 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 it triggers us to do, it can leave us to just think a person causing harm and not get the, the specifics so that we can properly assist the survivor or the person that's causing harm. I think that's all that I have for this one. Perfect. Excellent. You're getting a lot of agreement with that. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is one that I, I'm going to try not to go on for too long. I'm really kind of passionate about this just because of where I've seen even my own personal understanding and, and just as organization, as the DV field in general, as we've been learning, we have had such shifts and movements that have been so crucial, as Ruth said, right? So, of course, it was so limiting to have terms like batterer, um, because it, it was only focusing on physical abuse when we know that that is only one type of abuse and so many more people are experiencing emotional abuse, digital abuse, uh, financial abuse, uh, so much more or more often sometimes in physical abuse. Um, and so it was, um, it was exclusive, right? Uh, using terms like battering and, and batterer. Um, and so it's, I think the shift to abuser and, and perpetrator um, made sense in, in that piece, right? To not just focus on uh, what type of abuse, but just abuse in general. And now the shift moving to focusing on the behavior is also such an important one um, that challenges us in a lot of ways. And I understand the resistance that a lot of folks can have to yes. um, not labeling people, right? Um, because it's it's the one thing we know that we're conditioned to do since we are so young, right? Every book we read, every movie we watch, there is a villain, there is a good guy, there is a, you know, the protagonist, antagonist, every single thing that we've been exposed to has given us um, these tools of um, identifying, right, good people versus bad people, and we get very comfortable labeling people. And evolutionarily speaking, it makes sense. It's a way that we protect ourselves. When we feel like we can identify quote unquote bad people, we can feel safer around those who we surround ourselves with from removing ourselves from situations like that. Um, and the what really is uh, really important for, for us to sit with is that 
there's really no such thing as good or bad people, right? Um, I sat in a, in a training on transformative justice where Mariam Pablo uh, kind of took the stand during lunch and was just saying, we, we, need to, we need to kill good people. And everybody kind of turned around like, what is, what is she talking about? And she's like, we need to kill this idea of good people, right? Because once we put people into boxes, um, good or bad, we are removing the important piece of accountability, mm -hmm. right? And so if we um, are saying in the DV field and just what we're coming to understand in general that abuse is a choice, we, we say it all the time. Yep. We also need to say and understand that that choice can change, right? And by labeling people as an abuser, um, we're putting them in a box that we don't expect them to come out of, right? So it's a shift in, in our understanding. It's a shift in our understanding of a lot needs to happen for someone to change those kinds of really toxic, harmful, dangerous behaviors. Um, and, and it stems from their choices and those choices can change. And it's really hard, especially for those of us who have experienced abuse from someone and, and, and experienced significant harm. Um, it makes sense, right, to, to really feel like, um, I, you know, I hear a lot, abusers don't change, people don't change. Um, but it's a clear paradox. If we say abusers don't change, if we use that kind of terminology, and then we say abuse is a choice, right? Because if we say abuse is a choice, abuse as a choice could be a changeable choice. So there's so much to unpack there as far as where it comes from when we're, when we're putting people into these boxes. It's, it's really a safety mechanism. It's why we're so defensive when we learn that close people to us can be causing this kind of harm, right? Because if I was wrong around about my brother, if I was wrong about my favorite pop singer, then, I, then who am I wrong about, you know, who, what, can I trust my own instincts? And so it's such like, a, honestly, a philosophical question that we could take so much deeper when we have to unpack this, this, um, where it comes from and start addressing that there are a lot of factors that lead to um, harm continuing, right? I, I see here in the chat people saying like hurt people, hurt people. We, we hear those kinds of terms all, all the time and there's not, not enough addressing um, where harm starts, how we could prevent that harm. Yes. Um, and really focusing, right? Whether it's trauma, whether it's poverty, whether it's all of these intersecting factors, um, all of these things have to be addressed and work together along with the responsibility that someone has to take. And so we have to acknowledge that that, that choice can be changed um, if we're expecting someone to accept accountability. That's fabulous. Uh, I, yes, I love watching the chat. I don't know, you may not have that, um, but there really is, we're still, people have very different, different views on this and that's Great. So Ruth, did you want to expand on that? Or Victoria, did you want to add to that? We're really doing fine on time. So don't feel rushed right. or feel like you have to limit what you say. You know, wanna, oh, oh, go ahead, Ruth. No, no. Okay. Okay. I'll be sure. I'll be really short. Um, you have the toddler. I'll let you go. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to add that being that, because I'm reading the chat and I hear what we're saying, and it seems like it's, it's, it's very controversial. I think what, what seems like we would, would be helpful is we really need to hear from survivors. What would they, what do they want us to call the, the you know, the, pre, the person that is uh, to call the person that is causing them harm? It seems like it may be helpful. We need to have some listening sessions or something or get survivors and um, together to figure out, you know, and I know there's no perfect term, right. but if you're trying to get to a term, let's ask the people that are, and the, the people in the chat are saying abuser, period. So, you know, that may be something that we need to um, go back and, you know, um, go back and discuss because we you know um, if we're not current, you know, we could, we could be wrong. We could be wrong. So this one, it's yeah. totally think that is a fabulous idea, Victoria. Um, we can certainly, um, any one of us as an organization and or a future webinar can respond to that question and really figure not a pat answer again, but, you know, really figuring out what it is. Um, I want to be very clear about something, and I, I so appreciate April bringing us to the forefront. 
I am a firm believer, as is NCDV, about two things about those that cause harm in domestic violence to another. I'm going to use the term, at least for this webinar. Um, number one is I am a believer that the, the abuse that they cause is by choice and that they can change that. I don't know what that is. I believe that all humans are humans. We believe that humans are humans, but we also know um, unequivocally that they make the choice to do that. So how do we change their way of thinking? And how do we keep them human while addressing their abusive behaviors <laughs> and their harm to others? How do we do that, um, particularly around language, but then also in this other area and means of it? Um, I think that we as a society, number two, also have a real problem that when we use abuser, we begin to do all of the stereotypes in our minds. Uh, they are not the doctor in the emergency room who happens to be a white guy. They are not the, you know, blah, 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 blah. We immediately, as a society collectively, and I know that some of us don't and all of that, and those are conversations that are much deeper than we have time for, or that we can think about today. But I, I also want us to be thoughtful about what are the perceptions that society has about the words that we use. I firmly believe that's why we as a movement, as a survivor myself, I prefer the term survivor because back to Victoria's point, real early on, I don't know anybody stronger than a survivor, quite frankly, um, and someone who's navigated um, this horrible stuff that someone else has made a choice to do to them. So it's not, so I think that there's a much bigger question around the language that we use. What will be the perception? Is that person savable? Now that we've put this label on them, um, are they really savable? And, and do we do a throwaway thing? So um, just, I don't have the answer, but more to think about as we're talking about this, because I'm, I'm really good at giving you more to think about. <laughs> if we need ideas for webinars yeah. anyway, we can put right, it together. Right. So. There's really fantastic conversation going on in the chat box too. People are suggesting like controller, manipulator, um, which I find fascinating. Um, so I'm gonna digress just a little bit. This isn't the plan. But I've also seen some chatter here about the terms victim and survivor. Mm -hmm. um, do you all want to take just a minute to speak to that before we move to the last question? And I encourage people to, because we've heard some conversation around that over the years. Like, do we, are those really the right terms? Is that what um, those who are being harmed, is that how they refer to themselves? Do they want us to refer to them as such? So. Um, Chrissy, what are your thoughts? And I'll let, I'll let the three of you just, just pipe in when you're ready. Um, I, I think I can kind of pull from what Victoria said. And the last question is really needing to reflect and, and ask um, those who are experiencing abuse themselves what they're comfortable with. So. Um, I think a lot of a lot of people who've experienced abuse uh, from their partners may not identify as a victim and may not identify as a survivor as a survivor, nor be comfortable with either of those terms, right? Or or some may very much identify as a survivor, and that is a huge part of their identity of what they survived. Um, but can have very different feelings for uh, about the word victim, and there's so much to that to where it's really important to reflect the language that people themselves are using um, about their experience. And I think that there's a, a huge piece that comes from uh, the minimization that happens about abuse as a whole, as a tactic within the relationship and just um, within the society that we often find um, 
that there's a discomfort sometimes with some of the language that we're using and it might not feel appropriate or there's a lot of a uh, comparison that happens, right? Um, I may not be a victim because I know someone who experienced physical abuse and I experienced financial and emotional and it doesn't seem comparable when, when I think about that, right? How can I call myself a survivor when um, I was able to leave sooner than um, someone else who experienced physical violence, for example, and I didn't, so things like that, right? And so that can be a very valid um, experience that someone has that can speak to having any reservations about either of those terms. I know at the hotline, we reflect the language that the, the contacts themselves are using about their experience. And that's um, a key piece of how we approach it. We use victim survivor interchangeably as we're, we're training and of course talking about abuse. Uh, but when we're talking to someone, we reflect what they're sharing. And um, I think that's important just as we're navigating our conversations, reflecting what people are, are, are using for themselves. Awesome. Yes, and many people are reflecting that as well, April, to your point. So Ruth and Victoria, do you have thoughts on that? Absolutely, and I just couldn't agree with April more. I do think what we have to, when it's a one-to-one -one, um, strong interaction between two people or three people, we reflect back what that person is using in reference to themselves. Um, you know, as a victim, I did X, well, okay, is, is that where you are now? And that's perfectly fine, but really engaging in that conversation in a one-to-one. -one. I do believe that because we're society built on system and system support, uh, and it's certainly our experience at, here at NCADB, that we do use victim and survivor interchangeably. Uh, we have to be responsive to folks who support us, who support our work and uh, legislative folks who don't get it unless you say victim or survivor or, or grantors who don't get it unless you say victim or, you know, so the list goes on and on. So I think that there's a real difference between having an, a personal interaction with someone versus the language that we use overall. Um, for me personally, I prefer survivor because I don't want anybody to take anything away from what I went through, right? Um, and I know that other victims and survivors feel totally different about that. They just, they don't want, they don't want any of their identity going back to some of the underlying of what we've talked about today. They don't want any of their identity tied to that because it, you know, it's yet another label. So um, I, I really do think that there's two kinds of labeling when we're talking about victim and survivor. One is what does that person want individually, personally? And then how do we, are we really doing justice, quote unquote, uh, for those who have, have experienced that in a general sense? Very good. Victoria, do you have thoughts? You're good. Okay. All right. So we will move on to, oh, sorry, our last question. So <laughs> what does accountability mean to you in the overall context of this discussion? So. Do one of you want to start that or would you like me to choose? I'll choose. Victoria, how about you? I knew you were going to take me. I took myself. <laughs> <out of it. laughs> um, so, um, so I think, um, so what does it mean to me? So we know that uh, holding abusers accountable, it's, it's a part of, it's a necessary step into uh, obtaining safety and justice for um, survivors or victims. And I'm, I, when I was thinking about this question, I wanted, I, it's okay, I wanted to spend it a little bit to kind of address the, how does accountability look for those that use violence? How does, how does it look? Um, and so we know right now, we currently rely majority on the criminal legal system to prosecute and enforce consequences um, for those who use violence. And of course, I think that's useful um, to have our, our criminal legal system you know, um, holding offenders accountable. But I think that we, it's, it's time for us to start to explore and develop more tools to hold um, offenders accountable. Um, and I don't really wanna go deep into the concept in Ruth and April, you guys have been hitting on it almost with every question um, about uh, how intimate partner violence, uh, addressing intimate partner violence is truly anti-oppression work. 
Um, the same beliefs and systems that uphold racism in our community are the same ones that influence intimate partner violence. Um, and when we address the root of IPV, which is privilege, we are, we are um, engaging in anti-oppression work. How do, we, how do we end oppressive things in our, in our society? It's the community, it takes us. Um, and um, I, I love uh, referring to people because I love, it's, this is no new work. It's not new, it's stuff that we've been doing. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've all heard of Lundy Bancroft, the author of Why Does He Do That? And The Batterer's Parent. He said one time in a training that, you know, if the community truly held offenders accountable, we could end abuse tomorrow. And I, of course he was being a, a little funny, but I think what, what really stands out is how impactful the community is into holding offenders accountable. Community partners, stakeholders, we all play an important role in creating envir an environment that sends a clear message to offenders that this behavior is not tolerated in our society, in our community. Um, intimate partner violence has kind of been like woven in, in our, to, into our community and accepted. And we have to make a shift. We have to make a stand um, in holding offenders account accountable to me. I think the question says, what does accountability mean to you? To me, holding offenders accountable is, is taking back, demanding that they let go of their unearned privileges and power in their relationship. Um, and I'll stop there before I do another. That was video. beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I just wanna um, really shout out Victoria for naming one of the most important things that I think now the conversations are starting to move around is how these systems intersect um, and continue to support uh, IPV from being such a prevalent uh, issue to this day right? Historically, if we look at some of the most violent uh, things that have happened in our world, we can see how tools like sexual violence have been used to create and sustain violence like colonization, uh, violence like poverty nowadays, violence like uh, racism that continues. Since the dawn of time, we've seen physical violence, sexual violence as tools to support um, really damaging violence, right, overall. And so we cannot truly address um, and eliminate, eliminate intimate partner violence if we are not addressing how other forms of violence intersect and how it, it's all been used to, to kind of perpetuate um, where we are right now. And to expand from that, when we're talking about accountability, I think that it's really important to also think about what we mean when we're saying that, right? Because uh, I think we were playing with what is, what is it that we could call this session? Right, and there was a couple of different ways that we took the title, and I think there was a lot of interest because of, of really our curiosity. That seems like how do we hold abusers accountable? Right, that's such a huge question that so many people have, and it's also a little bit of a paradox too when you think about uh, what accountability itself means. That means self acceptance of of the behaviors, the harm. Um, that was caused owning that, recognizing that, the impact of that, and taking the steps to change that. That's accountability. It's very in-depth of a person's needing to understand and accept the, the true impact of their harm, right? And when we say holding someone accountable, that is really interesting. Anyone who's worked with um, folks, abusive folks, folks with abusive behaviors, know that the biggest step to changing those behaviors are needing to accept how harmful they are, yeah. right? And when we say holding someone accountable, um, it is uh, speaking to how we've, we've been handling it recently, how we've been really um, responding with very sort of punitive measures, right? And punishment towards these actions um, when we've seen that mandated things, like mandating a batterer's intervention program for someone, 
is not the most effective way to see behavioral change, right? When someone is forced to take a class, to do these things without actually wanting to accept accountability, it's not effective. Yep. We've seen that time and time again. And so we really need to kind of unpack what we mean by accountability, right? Because at this point, when we hold someone accountable, we're really just talking about punishment. We're really just talking about the carceral state. We're really just talking about um, what has been recently um, over the last 25 years kind of focused on in response, right? Um, but that does not end abuse. There is no study, no statistic that shows that that kind of punish punishment actually ends abuse for someone, right? Or them uh, continuing to cause abuse. But just last week when a, a new advocate I tra trained took a call, the survivor was sharing how uh, she didn't even get a notice from Vine um, that the partner had been let out. And she only found out when he showed up with a firearm to continue to menace her, right? Though he was locked up for so long. And so we know that how we're responding now is not ending the actual problem. And we really need to kind of focus on um, finding ways to establish um, more of a sense of being able to change these behaviors um, because otherwise they're just kind of pausing them for some time, right? So I saw someone earlier say like, uh, an abuser doesn't wanna identify as abuser, as in an abuser, of course, right? And that also interrupts them from accepting responsibility, right? And so when we, when we label someone in that sense, our, their first response could be just like, nope, I'm not admitting to it. I am not owning it. I am not gonna take these steps. Um, and that's what we really need abusive people to do. We need them to change their behaviors. We need the harm to stop. Um, and so accountability is really talking about how we um, as a society can accept responsibility for how we're harming other people. Um, so yeah, I will, I'll stop right there. Uh, let Ruth add on to that. Thank you. I couldn't agree with both of you more, um, but to kind of um, go back to the premise of why we, we wanted to do that, what was, which was flipping the script and talking about accountability and what does that mean? Um, I think in the context of this conversation is everything that we've talked about, which is properly placing the person who's coming, ha causing harm in our language, in our society, dealing with all the isms. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on of the things that we would need to um, uh, address as we move forward about what does accountability look like? But I think overall, what I have learned from this conversation today, because yes, I can still learn, uh, is I think we go back to hearing from others and, and conceptualizing those in our head. Like, what does the term abuser mean? What does that mean in the context of what I'm talking about at this moment? Not necessarily is this other piece, but what does it mean um, when I'm talking about it that way? Or is it causing harm to others? And all of those things um, with the bottom line being for me is that I still believe that we as a society have a responsibility to figure out from an uh, individual perspective and then certainly from a larger collective perspective about why we continue to have a society in which we have these two people, these two humans, or, you know, this, this person that's causing harm seems to have several um, victims in their wake, right? So what are we doing to, to quote unquote, interrupt that? And what, do our, what does our language play into that? What, is, what does our accountability play into that? Whether it's system accountability or me holding my brother accountable or my son accountable or, or it's setting some real clear boundaries as a young child 
uh, whether you're a female or, or male saying, you know, you, you need to know that when I know you're doing this, it's about a choice. So really flipping the script on why don't they leave to what can we do better to make sure that no one else causes harm? I wish it were that simple. I would like for all of you to go off, fix this, and then come back and report out. <laughs> and we'll go from there. Um, but I, but I really do think that it's a it's a it's a personal responsibility on all of us, and then a, certainly a societal responsibility to look at all those quote unquote isms and systemic ways in which we're dealing with anyone. Um, in our society, whether they're an abusive person, a victim, whatever it is that they are, how are we dealing with that? And how does that perpetuate any of the things that we've talked about today? So. Excellent. It has been wonderful. And a number of people have asked for the transcript of the chat. So yes, we will share that as well, because I agree there's a lot a good conversation going on here. And this was the intent of why we posted this um, controversial question. So uh, also people wanna hear more about this. So what we're seeing in the chat box is people uh, definitely want to continue this conversation. So, you know, collectively our group, we and our organizations will talk about how we continue to do, can continue this and in what way. So um, thank you all so much for this conversation. We're really right at time. So uh, there are a few people who have posted some questions in the Q&A box, one person in particular. Um, I'm not sure it is, but I'm gonna, we won't be able to answer the question here, but if you email us separately, we will do our best to, to see what kind of information we can provide you. Um, again, I would love to see every single one of you on this session at NCADV's conference in August of 2022. And the follow-up information email that you'll receive will include a link uh, to join that specific list. Once we're ready to open up our registration, we will be sharing it widely and we'll certainly be posing questions like this there and talking uh, in more detail about this and many, many other intersections. So here's some information about NCADV and different ways to reach us. Um, with Victoria and April's permission, we'll include ways to, um, reach their organizations if you have further questions about their work. Again, we want to make a special shout out to Tom's, Tom's Shoes, who made this webinar possible today, free to you all, and it was just wildly successful. So we're thrilled. Thank you all so much. Thank you for everyone for the work that you do. Victoria, Ruth, April, you all are amazing. And like I said yesterday, you have beautiful brains. <laughs> um, I'm honored to, to know and work with each of you and to Enterprise and our interpreters. Thank you so much. And all the other NCDV staff who helped put this together. So um, have a wonderful day and you know, happy holidays to those that celebrate. Uh, please watch what else is coming down the pike from NCADV, Ujima, and the hotline because they're rock stars. So, yes. um, everyone, have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And Bye, take ladies. good care. All right. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>